I'm going to be in uh, Genesis chapter 37. How many has ever heard the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors? How many has ever heard that story before? Raise your hand if you heard that story before. Come on, show me. All right. So we've heard this story before in Genesis uh, chapter 37. In verse number 19, I'm just going to read a couple portions of Scripture, and then we're going to go into the rest of it. In verse number 19... And 20 said, and this is Joseph's brothers talking about him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Almost in like a derogatory tone. Like if we could see somebody walking across that field and, and we look out there and we don't say, Okay, yeah, there's Drew coming across that field. And we don't say, Oh, there's there's uh, Connor coming across that, that field. Just kind of in a derogatory tone. It's like, Oh, the dreamer cometh. Oh, it's that dreamer. That one that says he's got these dreams that come from God. Oh, here comes the dreamer. And verse number 20, Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Let's destroy him. Let's kill him. Let's throw him in a pit. Let's carry out these plans. And all those dreams he talked about, and all those dreams that he was silly enough to believe, and all those dreams that he could see happening in his life, all those dreams, when then, after we kill that dreamer, then we will see what happens with those dreams. Now I want to share something that's on my heart today along these lines. Kind of a long title. You can't kill the dream without killing the dreamer. And the dreamer's not dead. <laughs> you, you can't. If they could have done something different to do something about those dreams that Joseph had, if they could have killed them, if they could have stopped those dreams, if they could have delayed those dreams, they would have done that. But they knew the only way that they could stop those dreams that God put in that boy's heart was to kill him. You can't kill the dream without killing the dreamer and the dreamers not dead. Why don't you pray with me for just a moment? Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, we got to get this. Pray with me in the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, Lord. I pray, God, that you would help us grab everything that you have for us today, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going I, I, to throw a monkey wrench in this whole thing. Can you move that tripod? Then You're going to need to move it, please, because I'm going to come pretty close to where you're at. And I'm going to get rid of this thing. And look. I feel like I'm preaching in another state up there. I do. I feel like I'm in Kentucky or something. And you guys are in Illinois. You guys going to be able to hear me okay? Pastor, am I all right? Okay. Good deal. So now I feel like I'm in here with y'all. I'm not going to leave any of y'all out. I'm going to be over there too, okay? Okay, so we're in Genesis 37. I'm going to back up a little bit and set the stage for what was going on here. In Genesis 37 and verse number 2, and, and we start talking about Joseph was about 17 years old, and he had brothers, and his dad uh, had a shepherding business. They had flocks that they would, they would take, all the brothers would take care of these flocks. And, but Joseph was his father's favorite son. He was Jacob's favorite son, and he showed that favoritism to him. Whether that's right or not, that's the reality of the way it was, that that was his favorite son. And he made for that son a coat of many colors, and it kind of showed that blessing or that favoritism or, or that, that uh, special calling on his life, whatever it was. But the other brothers hated that. I mean, how would that make you feel? Right, so I, I feel like they're somewhat justified 
in their feelings. But he had this, he was the special one. He was, you know, the chosen one in the family. And there was a time where um, the, the rest of the boys um, were being sent to go take care of the sheep in Shechem. And Joseph, before that, had had these dreams. And he'd had these dreams about what God was going to do with his life. And these weren't like, these weren't ravioli dreams or pizza dreams, like what you eat right before you go to bed dreams. This was, this was something that God put in him about what God was going to do with his life. And in those dreams, he saw his older brothers bowing down before him and, and, and showing reverence to him and different things. Well, when Zay, when he came and uh, 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 told, told that, Adrian, when they came and told that to his brothers, do you think that sit real well with them? No, they're like, who does this guy think he is? Who does he think he is? And so the Bible says that they hated him all the more. It's not just the favoritism or the coat of many colors, but now this guy's dreaming these dreams because he thinks he's all that. And he thinks someday we're going to be serving him. So they hated him. And so the Bible talks about when the other brothers went off to Shechem, the chosen one sat back and I don't know what he was doing, but he wasn't working. And so they're out there working hard, and they're in Shechem, and, and uh, Jacob sent Joseph out to check on his brothers. And the Bible picks up where I was talking about. They saw him coming over the hill, and they saw him walking towards them. And, and one of them looked up and said, Psh, look, look at walking there. Here comes that dreamer. Here, here comes that one that, you know, feels like he's so entitled and, and feels like he's got all this going on, feels like he's better than us and, and God speaks to him and dad favors him. Here's that dreamer. And they hated his dreams as much as they hated him. Do you realize you've got, you got an adversary of your soul that hates the dreams that God has for you probably more than he hates you? The devil hates the promises God has given you. The devil hates the future that God has for you. The devil would like to do something about those dreams. The devil saw you coming up over the hill to church today. The devil saw you on the way to prayer the other day. The devil saw you trying to find time to open up your Bible the other day. He hates the dreams, and he hates the dreamers. Because of the dreams in verse number 8, and they hated him all the more for his dreams. So they came up with this plan, and they, they decided they're going to get rid. They decided the only way they could get rid of the dreams was to kill the dreamer. That's, our, that's the only way we can deal with it. It's the only way we can get rid of the dreams is to kill the dreamer. So the Bible said they came up with this plan and they, they were going to kill him. They're going to throw him in a pit and, and all these other things. But I'm going to pick up in verse number 18. Um, this is going to backtrack just a little bit and then, and then, we'll, then we'll go forward. Verse number 18. They saw him afar off even before he came near unto them and they conspired against him to slay him. They said one to, an old, to another, Behold, the dreamer cometh. Then it goes into verse number 20 that I read for you before. Let us slay him and we will see what becomes of his dreams. So before we go any further at the story, let me, let, me just, let me just talk to us for just a little bit. In 1 Peter chapter 5, the Bible says in verse number 8 and 9, it says, stay alert, watch out for your enemy the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The purpose of his prowling, the purpose of his moving, the purpose of his hunt is looking for somebody that's in a position that he can devour them. That's what he's doing. He's looking for someone that he can devour. And the Bible says in verse number 9, Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. There's two things that I want to draw out of this. Very simple things. Very simple thoughts. But things to remember. So, Joseph was back home with his dad, right? Right? And, and then, then he got sent out to check on his brothers. And then when he got sent out to check on his brothers, that's when he got thrown in a pit. 
That's when he got sold into slavery. That's when all this stuff started to happen is when he was in a position when he wasn't close to his dad. I want to tell you something. The place where the dreamer, that dreamer inside of you, the plans that God has put in your life and the thoughts that God has for you and that dreamer inside of you that believed those dreams, Dre! The time that that dreamer is going to be the most vulnerable is when he's the farthest away from his father. When we get moved into a position, whether it's circumstance, and I know we've gone through this corona thing and we've been kind of put out of our order and our routines have been broken. Those times when we are a further distance away from our Heavenly Father, that is when the dreamer in us is the most vulnerable to attack. And the second part of that is this. This is the other message of the devil. In verse number 9, it says, Stand firm against him. Be strong in your face. And thus it says, Remember. Write it down somewhere. Commit it to memory. Put it inside of you somewhere. He says, Remember that your family of believers, that's us! This isn't like being a part of Sam's Club. This is the body of Christ. This is my family. Amen. You're my family, Rob. Amen. You're my family. You're my family. I'm not going to forget that because there's going to be times of isolation. And believe me, I've been in those places before. I've been in those places where I don't even want to get out of bed. I just don't even want to be a part of anything anymore. When we're going through a tough time, when we're going through a rough time, the devil will try to insulate you. And the Bible says in this following verse, it says, Remember that others in your family are going through the same trials and tribulations and tough spots that you are. Don't let the devil isolate you and say, You're all by yourself in your trouble. You're all by yourself in your, in your depression. You're all by yourself in your isolation. You're all by yourself in your anxiety and stress. God says, Remember you have a family. Yeah, yeah. That's, good. That's, good. That's what I love, Pastor Cotton, about what's happening right now. These last couple weeks. The devil don't like it, but we're having a family reunion. Amen. The devil don't like it, but we're having a family reunion. Woo! I'm strengthened. Galen midst off of when I walk up and I hug you and shut. I can't explain that. He's not all that cool, but I'm strengthened <laughs> when I hug him. Right. It's got to be more than that stylish beard. <laughs> you putting fairy dust in that thing or what? <laughs> Stand up. You're not distancing, are you? Hold on a second. Hold on. Go <laughs> Control yourself. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, this is, you're going to think this is silly, but it's true. And it's not all wrapped around hug. But you know what? There's something more that happens when I see him or I see you. And I walk up and I'm like, hey, man, how you doing? You know, whether it's that or it's a shake in the hand or your elbows or whatever you do or whatever it is. Yeah. You know what? Because it's family. That's my brother. And there's a connection that happens between us and family when we walk in the house and, and, and things. You know, it's like, you know, I was over here by myself and I was over here feeling isolated. But then I see you, Drew, stand up. I'm seeing you again. I see you, Drew. Hey, man, how you doing? And it's like, just some things never change. I feel like I'm back home. I feel like I'm being held by somebody that I know that loves me. Why? Because that's God's love. Remember, no matter what you're going through, that you've got a family that's going through it with you. Okay, Angie, he is kind of cute. I think I offended Angie when I said he wasn't cool. Okay, she's like, ha, ha, ha. 
thank God. How many is thankful for your family today? Hallelujah. We're not walking in this by ourselves. The devil would try to isolate us. But if we've been in isolation, we have been in a physical isolation. But it's time to reconnect. And it's time to come back together. And it's time to get together and say, hey, look, this is the way it's always been. I just wasn't experiencing it. Because when you get by yourself, the devil will work on you. You see, oh, they don't care about you. They don't care about you. Well, you know, he didn't elbow bump you and he elbow bumped somebody else. He's selective on his social distancing. Look at that boy. Right? Oh, they don't, they don't care about you. They just want your money. Right? Stinking rotten devil. Devil, you know why you're ticked off? Because you're not and you never will be a part of this family. God sealed your deal a long time ago, devil. So, I'm going to try to paraphrase this a little bit without killing it. So they, they, they took Joseph, they took the dreamer, and they threw him in a pit. And they decided to kill him. And a lot of other things happened and talked about and discussed. But finally they sold him into slavery. And he was taken to Egypt where he was sold into slavery and ended up in Potiphar's house. And, and we know all the things that happened. We may touch on those again. But what happened after that is then, so then they had to deal with Jacob after that. So they had to deal with Joseph's earthly father, Jacob. And so what they did is they took that unique coat, that coat of many colors that that father had made for him and had, had uh, put upon him to identify him. They took that coat and they dipped it in animal blood. And they took that back to their father and they tore it up. And all they had to do was hold that bloody torn up coat up in front of, of Jacob and say, look. Bible says in verse 31 through 34, And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt. Everybody say without doubt. Rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth about his loins and mourned for his sons many days. So when they took that coat back to him that was tore up and bloody, that father, Jacob, believed that the dreamer was dead. That moment, that moment of evidence, that could, but what a visual that was. Even though it was a short period of time, the visual of his son's coat all torn up with a bunch of blood on it, how traumatic and how impactful that evidence was to look at that day. Just, here it is, here's the coat. And the Bible says, without a doubt, he said, the dreamer's dead. My son is dead. Everybody say, without a, doubt. without a doubt. Let me propose to us today that there is a lot of doubt involved in that situation. Because to accept the evidence, to accept the evidence as being the judge of the situation, to accept the circumstances of life, the things that I see going on in front of me, to accept the things that contradict God's word, to accept the things in front of me that contradict God's promises in my life, to see the things in front of me, whether it's a hard time, a financial time, a painful time, a time where I feel uh, trapped or lost or stuck, stuck to, to accept that, to, to accept that, Without a doubt, this is just the way it is, without a doubt. It takes a whole lot of other doubt in the promises of God. It takes a whole lot of other doubt of the things God has spoken into my life. It takes a whole lot of other doubt. I have to doubt a lot of other things to accept that evidence without a doubt. 
You see, he was overwhelmed by the evidence and believed that the dreamer was dead. You know, I, I, I question myself, and I don't know, maybe I'm the only one that can fall into this situation, but I question myself from time to time, you know, how easy it is to be in a negative situation. You know, anybody ever been in a negative situation? Okay, I don't feel like Job out here swinging by myself out here. We're going to go through those times from time to time, right? That's just part of walking with God. I mean, we're going to have some situations, whether they're short term or long. We're going to go through some times from time to time. It doesn't have to be current. But how we have an ability to take our current circumstance when it's negative and project it into our future like it's going to be that way forever. Right. 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 Am I the only guy that does that? Raise your hand if you do that. Right now raise your hand even if you don't do that so I feel better. Nah. <laughs> we can take our negative current circumstance so easily and project that into the future and say, no hope, and this is the way it's always going to be, and it's always going to be like this, and blah, blah, blah. You know, I've noticed that if we're in a really good, maybe, okay, I'm just talking about me, I can be in a really good circumstance, I can have things going really well, and I can have things kind of going my way, and I'll be sitting there waiting for the hammer to drop and it all end. Right. Right. There ain't no way this can keep going, right, Javier? There ain't no way this can keep going. I'm just on a roll. It's just a temporary thing. You know what? I've got to get out of the evidence business and get into the promises of God business. It doesn't matter what kind of evidence you're looking at. It doesn't matter what kind of a bloody coat gets thrown in your face. The promises of God are the promises of God. And the dream is not dead unless the dreamer is dead. And do not let the circumstances and the evidence of life and your past and your present and your, your dismal future in your own mind kill the dreamer that God's put in you, Kobe. Don't let that stuff rob the promises of God out of your life. Don't let the voices of other people rob the promises of God out of your life. That evidence don't mean anything. Don't let the evidence kill the dreamer in you. They're not even connected when God is in the middle of it. Here's a scripture that I wish I believed. Here's a scripture that I wish I believed more than I do. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. That scripture in my Bible says you walk by faith and not by sight. Because I know I walk by sight and not by faith a lot of the times. If I didn't, I wouldn't be so messed up all the time. Because the dreamer walks by faith. I want it to become a part of who we are. That we walk every day by faith. But faith in the promises of God. Faith in the, the dreams God's put in our heart and in our lives. And not just dreams to do a bunch of things. Yeah, that too. But just to be in re intimate relationship with God. The dream to be content with who I am in Christ. The dream to walk in peace and not in turmoil. The dream to not be in anxiety and stress, but to walk in God's promises for my life. See, there's a lot of places that the dreamer could have died. You see, Joseph was a dreamer. God wants us to be dreamers, Matt. God just doesn't want to spend our whole lives praying against things that we're afraid are going to consume us. God wants us to pray prayers of faith and pray uh, uh, prayers of, of expectancy for the dreams that God wants to put in our lives. 
Not just dreams that, God, I hope I barely make it into heaven before you slam the door. But in Joseph's life, after he got, got betrayed by his brothers, you know, he held on to his dreams that God had given him. There were a lot of opportunities for that dreamer to die in him and for him to just to give up and accept his current circumstance. His dreams could have died when his brothers betrayed him. His dreams could have died when he found himself in a pit. His dreams could have died when he found himself in bondage. His dreams could have died when he found himself serving an ungodly master. His dreams could have died when he found himself as a servant and a slave. His dreams could have died when he found himself in prison and bondage and stuck. But they didn't die. And the dreams can't die unless the dreamer dies. That was the perfect time when I asked you to do that. Me too. And we're going to go through it. There's going to be times when we feel stuck. There's going to be times when we feel betrayed by God and by others. There's going to be times when we feel like everybody's against what God's trying to do. We're going to feel like people are against us or the situations are against us. We're going to be in a situation where we feel like, how is this going to happen? I know I feel like what God, I know what God wants to do. How is it going to happen? I just don't see it. And all that evidence is going to make us come to the conclusion like Jacob did and said, well, the dreamer's dead. The dreamer in me is dead because I can't see getting past this situation. <laughs> you know, um, we very easily could be in a situation today I, I, I'm preaching this message, but I have been before in a situation in my life where I was convinced that all of my dreams were dead. And you know, you could be in that situation, you may have been in that situation, you might be heading towards that situation. And you could say, well, cute little message, Brother Brown. Cute little message about Joseph and how he went through all that stuff. But I'm just not feeling it. I've been bound up. I've been messed up. I've been beat up. Cute message. But the dreamer's already dead. Too late! The dreamer's already dead. I can remember a dark time in my life that was so deep and so dark that I didn't even want to live anymore. And I woke up in the middle of the night yelling, but my dreams are dead. My dreams are dead. My dreams are dead. The dreamer, in my mind, in me, was already dead. And maybe you're in that position today. Maybe there's just been too much stuff. There's just been too much pain. There's been too much hurt. There's just, I've disappointed too many people. Too many people have disappointed me. There's been too many letdowns. There's been too many failures. Why don't you stand with me if you would, please. I, I want to say this. I'm going to be directed of God. I want to say this. We talked about a lot of places that the dreamer didn't die. He was in prison. He was in a pit. He was betrayed. He was sold into slavery. He was sold out. In all those places, he didn't die. We all recognize that, right? 
that the dreamer stayed alive? Let me tell you one more place that the dreamer stayed alive. The one more place that the dreamer stayed alive was in the comforts of the palace also. In the comforts of the palace, the dreamer stayed alive. And it's not just bad things in our life that can kill the dreams that God has for us. It can be the comforts of life. It can be when life's going really good. It can be when we, if everything seems like it's going our way and it's just smooth sailing and easy going, Javier. And the dreamer that God gave dreams for what He wanted to do with their lives can die in those comfortable situations too. And a little side note God sent me to tell us today is don't let God's dreams for us be replaced by a fantasy. Don't, don't let the dreams be replaced with a fantasy. What I think will happen. What I want to happen. What I think will please this flesh. What I think is comfortable. What I think my purpose ought to be. What fulfills me. The palace will kill a dream or two. You may feel defeated. You may feel frustrated. You may feel hopeless. You may look back over your past and feel cursed. You may see the evidence of your right now and feel stuck. You may be looking at your future and expecting failure. You may feel cold and indifferent. Feel like God's a million miles away. You may always feel like you'll always be in this dismal cycle of returning to this same cold and indifferent place. Too late for me, Brother Brown. That dreamer died a long time ago. I'm not dreaming anymore, I'm just surviving. Too late, brother. That was a cute story. Thumbs up, like, heart for Joseph. My story don't go that way. My story's different. The dreamer's dead, and the dreams died with it. Well, I don't mean to rain on your little pity party. But you ain't the only dreamer I'm talking about. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29 11, this is God talking, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. They're plans to prosper you and not to harm you and bring you to a hope and to a future. You see, the good news is, Franco, I'm not the only dreamer in this ball game. God says, I know the dreams I have for you. He even knows the dreams he has for you. He's got dreams for you, plans for you. The whole time Joseph was going through all that junk, it was just God working his plan. You see, the dreamer in me might be dead right now. 
But I have a God Amen. that has dreams for me. I've got scripture for that. And you can't kill the dream without killing the dreamer. And there ain't nobody that's going to kill my God. Ain't no circumstance going to put down the dreams God has for me. Ain't no, no anything going to put down. No temporary pit. No feeling of being stuck. No depression. No anxiety. No, you can't come up with anything that's going to kill your God or the dreams that He has for you. It's not based on evidence and it's not based on feeling. I want somebody to respond to the Word of God today. I want somebody, despite the evidence that you've had in your life, I don't even know who I'm talking to, but I woke up this morning with such an in intensity in my spirit that God said, reaching for somebody saying, you believe the dreams are dead for you. Don't believe that lie. Amen. 